there's only one thing I've done to that track. Now, this is a, a little secret of mine, but now no one in America knows this, so only you, you here in Mexico City know this. I haven't told this to anyone in America. I use this, uh, I use this, this uh, plug-in here from Waves. Now, the interesting thing about this plug-in is it takes your, it's an equalizer, but it's not, it's not your standard analog equalizer, and that's what's great about the digital world now. We're starting to get away from analog emulation. We're starting to do things unique to digital. So this digital equalizer, what it does is, one, you can see here, let's see, you can see here that there's this thing that says digital. You can have U.S. vintage, vintage one, U.K. vintage, U.S. modern. You can have all types of different types of, of, di of, uh, of, uh, of wave bands here. Uh, some modeled after other things, some strictly digital. But what I love most about this is the MS function. Now, what that means is it takes my two-track mix and splits it into a mid and a side. Now, any of you that have done MS recording know what that means. Any signal can be taken, any stereo signal can be taken into the two-component mid and side. In fact, in, in a certain sense, the vinyl disc was based on that. It had a lateral and a vertical. This is, what this does is it takes the information going to the center that's the mid, okay? And then the information going to the sides is then put on one track, and those two are used in conjunction with each other to manufacture the final stereo sound. Now, what's interesting about this equalizer is it, it distributes the mid and side into two channels which you can EQ differently. Now, why is that important? Well, for me, it's important because... I love having a really tough, punchy center. But I don't want all that stuff spilling out to the sides. So I'm EQing a lot of punch in the center, okay? But I'm taking out, I'm, I'm putting in a lot of 100, maybe 60 cycles, but I'm taking out a lot of 200 cycles because I don't want it to be woolly, I want it to be punchy. Then I'm letting the 200 cycles go to the side and adding a little bit of spit on the side mic while not putting it on the center mic because uh, the center section because that's going to make the vocal spit too much. So I have flexibility between the mid and the side and I've done that with this equalizer. So that's the only thing that's being done to my main track. But now in addition to this main track, I have what I call the comp track. Now, the, the, uh, what I'm using here isn't available, but I'll show you, uh, I'm using a, um, an EMI compressor from the Beatle days, but this, this will suffice. Uh, this is a 70, 11, I mean, uh, Fairchild emulation. Okay, so as you can see, that's a heavily compressed track. Now, what happens when you combine the two of these? Okay, well actually that was the two of them, hold on. This is the, yeah, there you go. Let me bring the level of that up a little bit here, let's see. That's that classic old 
way the hell over compressed kind of sound. So now what I can do, but I, you know, I don't want that, I don't want that sound to be, uh, let's see, on my record all the way. So what I've done, let's do this. Yeah, here we are. So now, if I take my mix, let's go a little further in, so. This is uncompressed. For some reason I'm losing a tom-tom over there, but I don't know what that is. Now, this is, I'm gonna bring in the compressor. That's with it out. You'll hear how the bass suddenly lasts longer. It drifts. You also get a little more punch. That's out. That's in. I can still feel your ghost in the music. You can hear those compression artifacts on the vocal, the little kind of things that we all like to hear. But we haven't cut off the front end of everything by just going compression because in the digital world we can do this parallel compression, automatic delay compensation, make sure they're absolutely in phase so there's no time difference. They completely add and now I've enhanced my mix by just doing a very simple thing. Let's take that one step further, okay? Another thing that I like to do is add space to my mix. Well, space is a funny concept because in a two-dimensional world, it's, it's difficult to generate space. Well, the way we generate space in a, in a stereo recording is through the use of delays and, and through things like that. Now, I've done some delays and stuff already in this recording, but then I do something that's a little unusual. And that is, I take all of the tracks from my submix and I bring them into this thing I call S Delay. Now, what's S Delay? It's like a, like hearing it in an auditorium or something, a little from a distance. Right? Well, if you were listening to this record in a live situation, there'd be some of that in it. Right? So I say, let's liven this mix up a little bit by adding. Nope. That's without it. It's a little lifeless. But now, now you're getting a little more spread. It's almost a little more life to it. It moves a little bit. So that's, that's part of the concept is you're now, you're, you're not just mixing a record. It's more now about let's add a little life. Let's add some emotion to it. Let's not just mix a drum and a bass and a guitar. Let's pretend that we're in a room somewhere. We're listening to this thing. Let's get the message out. Now, I've taken that even further on some mixes and, and done multiple layers of this, but, the bonnet, but, but in, in every instance, the ideas are the same, okay? You're doing, now, the last thing um, is, and then I have the trash track, which, what the trash track sounds like, oh, well, we don't have the trash track because, oh, we might. Um, Usually I have the, the devil oak on a trash track, but let's see, on this one I actually, I use just a bunch of guitar fuzzes. No, we're not getting the... Uh, Oh, it looks like these aren't in. Let's see. Oh, oh, the levels. No, wait. What's is that? Because there we are. Okay. Well, 
it, uh, these are uh, obviously not totally set up right, but, but anyway, you can add some of this into the mix. Now, now you're not going to hear that as distortion. You're just going to hear that as some kind of harmonic thing going on inside of it. This is what you can do in the digital world. You really can't, can you do it in the analog world? Yes, but with an awful lot of effort. A lot of patching, a lot of sending tracks around to make them work. In the digital world, this is easy. You can, I can send these to another half dozen buses and do all kinds of things with them. But that's the concept. The concept is to, to use these brand new tools that we have to not just mix something, but add some life, add some new kind of elements to it and so forth. Now, this is a standard pop song. Obviously, with something like a hip-hop track or a, an electronica track or something like that, you can even go a whole lot further. And in the pop world, there are certain areas you can go and other areas you don't want to go. But basically, the concepts are always the same. Now, whether I'm mixing a classical album from Bocelli or whether I'm doing something like this, I still use those, those basic principles of grouping things together in buses and then using the tools at my command to try to manipulate those sounds, make them into something more than just the reproduction of a, of a studio track, try to make them sound a little more lively like they've been, they've been done somewhere else. So. Uh, you can use anything. Basically, I have a series of them depending on the song that you use. On this song, I'm using, um, I'm using uh, uh, the real verb pro from, but it can be any reverb. It's just a very tight, you know, tight reverb. And then I'm spreading it out with an imager. And the reason for that is if you, if you put that track inside the track, it's just going to lay there. The, by taking the stereo image and, and playing with the phase a little bit, it actually makes it come out of the speaker a little bit. So you've got your basic dry thing here, and it's almost like adding a surround channel. So that's why uh, you, don't, you may not hear it here as much, but in a room you really get the feeling that, that it's more lively, more lively, and more, more, more present. Uh, but sometimes I don't like the reverb. So when not using the reverb, sometimes the reverb's too much, so I may use something like this, the Cooper Time Cube, or any delay would work. But, you know, I just set up a couple of settings on that to, to, to bring it out. Some, you know, it varies on what I do. So, um, well, again, I set the, I set the pre-delay enough on the reverb or on the Cooper Cube or whatever delay I'm using. I listen to the low end and see if I'm interfering, and I keep moving the pre-delay back until it doesn't interfere with what I'm trying to do. So as far as the bus goes, it's the same bus that's going to the comp track and the, the mix track. It's everything. Now, there are some instances where I didn't like the effect on the vocal, but I loved the effect on the, on the track or vice versa. And then I do go to two, you know, you can just keep sub-bussing forever. I, I have a band, after I do the drum, guitar, bass, I'll then send that to a band sub-bus, and then I'll send the vocals to a vocal sub-bus. The band sub-bus will go to this, whereas the vocal sub-bus won't. And, in other words, like I say, there's a lot of permutations that you can go through here, but by and large, it's, it's, you have the ability in the digital world to do these kinds of things. So, most of those plugs are made by company called United Audio, UAD. They have uh, a card, uh, a quad card that you can plug into the PCI bus of your computer, or they have a Firewire, it's this thing here, um, and, uh, but they make terrific, uh, just a whole host of terrific plugins and so forth. So, um, you know, UAD, Waves, um, there's a new company called Sound Radix, whose stuff I love. We'll get next to what I do in the final 
final stages here using um, a company called Slate who makes some incredible stuff, uh, Stephen Slate Digital, but um, that, that's coming up. In a world of high fidelity, I wouldn't have to go to this next step. But I don't live in that world. I live in a world where people listen on MP3s and where people want to listen to stuff louder and louder and louder and louder, especially the artist. No artist wants to hear their song and then hear somebody else's song 5 or 10 dB louder. But I don't want to be boxed in. I don't want to have to mix that way. So what I do is this. I have my main mix track, which is the top one there. That's strictly coming off of this, these buses here that I've just played for you. Nothing else, just what I've done there. That's for me. That's for the mastering engineer. I got to do something for the artist, okay? Because the artist is going to listen to this and then she's going to play me back the rough mix that her engineer did when they were doing the vocal track and he went through like an L2 or something and squashed it like that and it comes up like 30 dB louder than my mix and she says, yeah, I love the sound of it, but it's not loud. So what I do is this. I have a second mix bus and across that mix bus, what I do is I put, um, let's go here. First thing I do is I use this device, which is called a Fatso. And the Fatso's concept is it just adds a little bit of uh, harmonic content. I don't, if, if you look at the Fatso when I run the mix, you're not really going to see... You don't see it working at all. It's just, it's really for color. It has a nice color. On, it has a retro kind of color, and so I use it on, on this particular song. I then also, this is where I go to my two, sometimes I do it in some, but again, this is a retro song, so I've now gone to, the, uh, uh, to, to, this, uh, to this Ampex tape machine. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how. I know there's a way to do this, cause I, but I can't find it. Anyway, there's a way to open this up and get under the hood. Um, and uh, so, but the, uh, so my mix then goes from the from the uh, fatso to this, and finally, this is a little device made by Stephen Slate. There's a there's a new programmer there named Fabrice Gabriel who's really really smart and really, really cool and really, really uh, amazing in, in the way he hears and translates that into code. And he's come up with this box called the, the Virtual Mix Bus. And this allows you to dial in various sonic signatures of different consoles. One of the sonic signatures is Brit 4K, which is, it's an SSL 4K. Um, USA, which is, uh, um, yeah, there you go, okay. All right. Um, the Brit N is the Neve, and then the Trident, and then there's this thing called the RC Tube. And that just takes a little of tube harmonics and places them into the mix. Now again, I was going retro on this mix, so I'm adding this drive control here. As you can see, it goes from minus six to plus six. I'm just off the zero mark. Not a big deal. I just, literally, it's, it's, it's just to add a little bit of that. Now, there's one thing that I could have used on this mix, which I didn't, because at the time, I didn't have the HDX10 card, which is heat. Now, heat is made 
uh, is, was invented by a guy named Dave Hill, and anybody who knows anything about audio knows who Dave Hill is. And he's come up with some incredible stuff over the years. Crane Song was one of his things. Um, Dave has come up with some terrific stuff. And what can happen is you can add heat to your overall mix or individual tracks. Heat does a similar thing to what my little mix bus thing did, just does. It adds either tube or uh, even or odd order harmonics. Okay? Now, so I could have done it that way, but as I said, my particular rig was a native rig. Heat only runs on a TDM or AAX system, which I didn't have. Uh, I have one now, but I haven't, haven't set this mix up with it. So, so basically, uh, I could have done that. The beauty of this versus what I did is this goes across every channel. And the other beauty out of it is you can globally manipulate the amount of each track. So you don't have to do it one track at a time. You can do it globally. 